My name is Luciano Cardellicchio, and I'm a lecturer in technology and design at University of Kent. And today, I want to talk about why it's important to start talking and analyzing conservation or restoration issues of contemporary buildings, and not only the historical ones. This can be seen as an odd matter. Why we need to discuss conservation issues in contemporary architecture if those buildings are newly built? Let me start with a bit of a context. Today, the way we fabricate buildings and in general things is based on economic models described by the linear sequence of events of taking, making and disposing. This sequence relies on large quantities of cheap materials that we take and easily accessible energy that we use to make things that we dispose at the end of their life. What if Instead of fabricating things following this linear system, we rethink our progress in a circular way where the resources and the material we exploit at once are put back in circle to create new objects. Why we don't start designing products that can be made to be made again? This is the idea of an alternative way of making business, an economy system that is called circular economy. A circular economy is restorative and regenerative by design and aims to keep products, components and materials at their highest utility and value at all times. A circular economy works effectively for every object at every scale, for manufacturing a plastic bottle or a building. We are investigating today what it means applying circular economy principles in the construction industry. In other words, how the circular economy will progress our way of uh, constructing buildings, avoiding the exploitation of new raw materials. The construction industry demands over half of the world's extracting materials and generates around a third of the total waste generated in the EU, making it a prime candidate for applying the circular economy. A building is a very complex organism made out of several components, facade panels, air ducts, steel, concrete or timber structure. Each of these type of components can be fabricated using circular economy principles. Components that will be able to be reused and upcycled for the future generation. In my research, I'm particularly interested in understanding the impact of the circular economy on the load bearing structure of a building the skeleton, how to make sure that the material utilized for the beams, the columns, the flooring and the roofing system can be used over and over again in the long term, how we can extend the life of a structure without relying on the exploitation of new raw material. Two other ways to conceive a load bearing structure designed to follow circular economy principles. The first one is to design buildings that are more adaptable. Buildings where we can house functions beyond the use for which they are designed. This allows us to have a flexible built environment able to respond to the changes of different economic and social changes without demolishing what we have already built. An example of this can be seen in the several office buildings left empty by the financial crisis in 1992 and 2008 that across Europe, especially in the Netherlands, have been reconverted in residential buildings. In these cases, the building skeleton was flexible enough to allow flats what it was the open space of the building. An example of this approach can be seen in London, where the Archway Tower, built in 1963 by the UK government as office building, has been reconverted into a residential tower in 2013. The second way of introducing circular economy principle for a structure is to increase its ability to be disassembled without affecting the integrity of any component. This approach can provide beams or columns that are reusable in the long term for erecting new buildings without relying on new raw material. An example of this can be seen if this feasibility, in this feasibility study I designed for the expansion of Kent School of Architecture, 
where the connections between the components, such a beam and a column, allow an easy to allow an easy detachment without impairing the use of that beam or that column for different building in the future. So let's assume that na from now on, all the buildings we design will be easily adaptable or dismantable. Let's imagine a future where our built environment will be a gigantic organism being able to be adapted and not demolished to address the challenge of a dynamic economic and social changes. My question now is, if everything around us will be easily dismantable and reusable, which buildings will be part of the heritage of tomorrow? What will leave to our future generation? What will our future monuments will be? And more specifically, what the future generation will need to preserve. In 1997, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, designed by the Canadian-born architect Frank Gehry, finally opened. Due to its attractive complexity and charming use of non-standard geometries, this building contributed incredibly in spreading out a new architecture language, supported by digital tools gradually more powerful. The impact of the project on Bilbao was extraordinary. Tourists start to visit the Basque city to see this new and flashing contemporary monument, revitalizing the economy of what was a city severely depressed after the closure of the steel plant in the 70s. After the opening of the Guggenheim Museum, a phenomenon named by the philosopher John Reichman, the Bilbao effect, caused a proliferation of this architectural language throughout Europe. After 1997, the use of architectural icons designed by internationally acclaimed designers was seen as a good practice to start the gentrification of the press neighborhoods, cities, or even region. Not surprisingly, in the last 20 years, Examples of these new iconic buildings flourished everywhere and now can be seen in Germany, Austria, Italy, France, Spain, Portugal and the UK. Different city councils and private clients start wanting their own Bilbao Museum. As is easy to understand, the engineering and construction process of these buildings is very complicated. Erecting these double curved geometries means going through a technical development where the design and the engineering team work closely together to find bespoke solution and customized type of facades where several building components are fabricated and assembled together for the very first time. We can easily argue that with their iconic status and their cultural contribution, these buildings will be our generation's legacy for the next. In other words, this celebrated structure are likely to be part of the heritage of tomorrow. Therefore, a question can be raised. Are these buildings constructed to last? Will the future generation be able to afford their maintenance and conservation. Despite the several mock-ups erected to test the bespoke fabric of these iconic buildings, the only tool we have to assess how these innovative buildings wrapped by, by unique facade systems are aging is the time. Often the time is generous with this architecture, sometimes it's not. Thus, after 20 years, from the opening of the Guggenheim in Bilbao, I engaged in a reflective research project where I analyzed if our future generation will be able to afford to preserve these iconic buildings. Today, I want to present the answer to this question to one contemporary iconic buildings in Rome, which has been the case study of my last research project, the Jubilee Church designed by the American architect Richard Mayer and completed in 2003. The church 
was one of the several places of worship playing in the outskirts of Rome to celebrate the Roman Catholic Jubilee of the year 2000 with the program entitled 50 Churches for Rome 2000. The program was the outcome of an urban strategy put forward by the General Authority of Rome together with the Vatican. According to the expectation of the Vatican, a new and more inclusive architectural language for religious buildings was demanded in order to offer more welcoming religious buildings which were more open to the cities and had spaces for different social activities. The briefs for these new churches included small theatres, meeting rooms, playground, parish houses and of course church halls. For the Jubilee Church, the Vicariate launched an architectural competition where only six architects were invited. Amongst the other, Tadao Ando, Santiago Calatrava, Richard Mayer and Frank Gehry. The names of these international well-known architects suggest that the Vatican wanted to choose between proposal with international recognition. The year of the competition was 1994. The Guggenheim in Bilbao was under construction. Mayer's winning proposal displayed its iconic power in three gigantic shells on the eastern side of the building. The church itself was conceived as a void confined between these shells in a secondary block where a theater and a parish house was located. Due to the complexity of the technical development of the building, the church opened in 2003, three years after the deadline of the Holy Year. Representing the most challenging aspect of the structure, the technical development of the church focused on the three double curved walls. They were conceived as elements borrowed from spher spherical geometries. For their geometrical feature, an extensive engineering process was necessary to understand how to build them. As always happens, the technical development of this type of buildings brings innovative solutions that increase the knowledge in the construction sector, turning the building process into a pedagogical platform for the future. The history of the construction of this church is quite complex. After being awarded, the project was analyzed by the technical advisor of the Vicariate, Professor Antonio Micheletti, structural engineer at the University La Sapienza, and former apprentice of the famous Italian structural engineer Pierluigi Nevri. During the first steps of the technical development of this building, Ital Cementi, one of the international leaders in concrete manufacturing, made the offer to the Vatican to be the supplier of the concrete. This generous offer drove a substantial change in the project's development, which was originally conceived to be built in steel and with a cladding in concrete panels. For the three shells, the team of engineers developed instead something that could be described as a more advanced version of traditional stone masonry. Their intuition developed a pioneering version of a masonry wall made by gigantic ashlar maintained together by steel cables running within. Everything about the construction of this church was customized. Even the traveling crane to erect the shells was designed specifically for this building. Also, Ital Cementi used the church to test a new whitening mix of concrete. The mix was added to Carrara marble powder and titanium dioxide to whiten the cement. Titanium dioxide is well known as a pigment in paint and coatings to obtain a perfect white, but this was the first time it was mixed with cement. Italian Cementi claimed that the cement would destroy air pollution and therefore the shells could keep their brightness for longer. After 40 years from the opening ceremony, I came back to the building to run a technical survey to assess the aging process of the church in order to reply to the questions I stated before. How the bespoke technical solutions invented for the church 
are aging. Does the church need to be maintained regularly? And if so, the conservation work is affordable now and it will be in the future. My report showed that both the curved and plain facades of the church are experiencing black acid rain deposits. Due to the heavy polluted air in Rome, this phenomenon is well known and causes the regular cleaning of the monumental facade of the Eternal City. My research showed that on the convex side of the shells are evident black particles in the more scattered area, while on the concave side only the top of the shells is affected by this phenomenon. This is because how the rain washes the shells differently from one side to the other and because the top of each shell lack of steel flashing with drip edges which is used in conventional buildings to deflect the rainwater from the facade. Flashing and window ledges with drip edges are lacking also on the facade of the parish house where same acid rain deposits are visible. In addition to that, the exposed concrete surface of the shell has visible fissuring throughout the facade. And quite a few elements in steel seems they had a poor level of galvanization and today are visibly rusted. In 14 years, the church did not have any maintenance due to its high cost, not affordable for a small parish in the outskirts of Rome. The premature decay of this building is not analyzed from a critical perspective, but with the aim of learning how to improve the technical development of this type of building. My research shows that despite the major engineering effort in erecting the concrete shells, some construction details that are typical of the way buildings are constructed in Rome were missing in the design. These details are missing because they are not part of the stylistic repertoire of the architect. These details, such as the window ledges with drip edges, are the ones that guarantee an easier maintenance of the building. This is one of the consequences of the cold Bilbao effect. The use of a global architectural language can overshadow the need of technical components that are developed in the vernacular and local style. Thank you.